Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Sober Speak. Sober Speak is a place where you will find podcasts of men and women sharing their stories centered around the Alcoholics Anonymous 12 Steps of Recovery. My name is John M. I'm an alcoholic, and I will be the host of this episode. Consider, so to speak, if you will, a meeting between the meetings. And I have Christina H. here with me today, and she is going to start with a reading from uh, something she has brought along that she wants to share with us today. So it's always hard for me to pick just one thing to read because my brain goes a thousand places, but um, this was what hit me this morning, um, and it's on page 50 of the big book. It says, Here are thousands of men and women, worldly indeed. They flatly declare that since they have come to believe in a power greater than themselves, to take a certain attitude toward that power, and to do certain simple things, there has been a revolutionary change in their way of living and thinking. In the face of collapse and despair, in the face of total failure of their human resources, they found a new power, peace, happiness, and sense of direction flowed into them. This happened soon after they wholeheartedly met a few simple requirements. Once confused and baffled by the seeming futility of existence, they show the underlying reasons why they were making heavy going of life. Leaving aside the drink question, they tell why living was so unsatisfactory. They show how the change came over them, that when many hundreds of people are absolute are able to say that the consciousness of pre- the presence of God is today the most important fact of their lives, they present a powerful reason why one should have faith. Perfect. And that's from the big book? Right? That's from the big book on page? page 50 and 51. Page 50 and 51 for those of you who want to look it up and go there. So... Uh, Keep in mind, we welcome all of your comments, and you can get in touch with us in a couple of different ways. Uh, You can go to SoberSpeak.com and click on the Contact Us tab, or you can email us directly at feedback at SoberSpeak.com. We welcome not only your feedback, but highly encourage it. Um, SoberSpeak is a self-supporting organization through our own contributions. We are not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. We do not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorse nor oppose any causes. Please remember that we do not speak for any 12-step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want, leave the rest at the curb. That's right. All right, Christina. So we're going to get right into it here. So uh, first of all, I know that uh, just through a br- little brief conversation we had before we started today, that um, your your daughter is on a mission trip uh, through some work that you do with a particular organization, and I know that that's a little bit on your heart. So let's just go ahead and talk about that right off the bat. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Christina, and I am an alcoholic. Um, and and what, what's your sobri- just so the okay. folks out there in this world know, what is your sobriety date? It is February twenty seventh, two thousand two. February 27, 2002. You know, and, and I want to explain this. We've never really, I, I don't think we've ever talked about this on Sober Speak. And that is that I know a lot of areas of the country, a lot of the areas of the world do not give their sobriety date uh, when they start to share, right? But we in Texas happen to share those sorts of things. And it's not because we're bragging. It's because we're trying to tell people that this way of life works. People can stay sober. And so that's why I asked you to identify yourself. Yeah. And I like that. I like that people give their sobriety date. Um, I think it's important for us to recognize in ourselves how long we've stayed sober. I know I attend my home group uh, is the Frisco group of Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's a lot of new sobriety there. And I know when I came in to hear that people had substantial sobriety was unbelievable to me because I couldn't stay sober for a day, much less a year or 16 years. Um, So I I like that we give our sobriety date. I do too. All right. So let's go back to your daughter. I got you off track. Sure. What's she doing? And I also want to talk about the organization you're part of and how you became part of that. Okay. Sure about that. Well, I can start out and say that when I was drinking, I was of no use to anybody. I had been laid off from my job and I literally sat on the sofa with my um, dog 
fat beagle who was 51.5 pounds. His name was Sherman. <laughs> 51.5 pounds and his name was Sherman. Now, was just out of curiosity, is Sherman still with us? Sherman is not still with us. Oh. He is in heaven waiting to be reunited with me <laughs> at some point in the future. Okay, I'm good. positive of it. Um, but anyway, Sherman was, my husband traveled a lot and Sherman would, Sherman and I would have conversations um, where I would, well, I wasn't really, he didn't talk back. I'm not that loony, but <laughs> I would tell him, I'd look over at him, and he was obsessed from food with food from the time I got him. Like, not like a normal dog where they could just take it or leave it or they'd eat a few kibbles. He would inhale everything around him. And it occurred to me that I was like that with alcohol. And so I related to Sherman, and he followed me everywhere. And um, we would we'd sit on that sofa, and I'd look at him and say, Sherman... Tomorrow's going to be the day. You're going on a diet. I'm going to quit drinking, and it's going to be different tomorrow. We are going to get up, and and we're gonna we're gonna do it. And so, I'd, I'd get up the next morning. I'd give him a normal portion of dog food, and by. 10 30 or 11 somehow the thought would occur to me that maybe it was okay to have a glass of wine and i'd look over at sherman and i generally was out of wine because i'd consumed it all the day before yeah. and so we would make a run to the drive through beer store and then i would go through mcdonald's and get him a happy meal uh <laughs> And we'd get home. Sherman ate Happy Meals? He ate Happy Meals. Yeah, he liked a cheeseburger with no pickles. Just out of curiosity, I'm not real familiar with the uh, the beagle world. Uh-huh. What, what, how much does a average beagle usually weigh? Okay, so that's a great question. They generally weigh about 30 pounds. Okay. So he was morbidly obese. That's what the vet said. And every time I would take him to the vet for anything, and they would bring up the fact, I was very defensive about, I didn't want anybody calling him fat. And so when the vet would bring up that he was morbidly obese, I would remind the vet, that's not why we're here today. We're here today for his rabies shots. I I wasn't very receptive to feedback at that time. Just out of curiosity, how many years did uh, Sherman Sherman live? Ten and a half. And he saw me sober for a good bit of time. So, yeah, so he he didn't lose weight, but I got sober. How long does an average beagle live? I'm sorry about all this beagle talk. That's okay. Probably about 15 years. Okay. We had a few health problems that may or may not have been related to the (laughs) consumption of food. So... Happy meals. Great. Happy meals, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Just out of curiosity, did he get the nuggets or did he get the... Uh, no, he liked a cheeseburger with no pickles. <laughs> no pickles? Yeah. Huh. He I wasn't a fan know. of the pickles. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, so... So so back to my daughter. Somehow yeah. we're, we're digressing into beagle talk. Um, so, as I was saying, I wasn't really very... Um, able to contribute positively to society in any way toward the end of my drinking. I had managed to have a successful career and balance the drinking. I can see at the end of my career that it it had started to catch up with me. And I look back and see that my behaviors while at work were very alcoholic behaviors, even if I wasn't consuming alcohol Mm -hmm. when I was at work. Mm -hmm. Uh, There were times that I did. I would leave for lunch and go have a glass of wine or two and go back. But for the most part, um, it was more the behaviors that one associates with alcoholism that I see rampant through my career. Yeah. Um, so when I got sober, um, the first year or two, my life revolved around Alcoholics Anonymous. I needed to get a job when I sobered up and my husband, we had just built a pool and we purchased a new home and we had done that counting on two incomes. They didn't have any children had been married um, five years about that time, and we had counted on me working for a few more years. And so he was a little panicked at the prospect of not having an income from my side of the street. Um, And he kept saying, okay, this is great. Like once I told him I was going to AA because I didn't tell him before I went. Um, And I, um, I, when I did tell him, he was like, okay, that's great, but what about a job? And I was talking to, I had a sponsor by that time. It's, well, hold and, on, just make sure yeah. you're, it's great you're going to AA. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, really he proud just wants, you, yeah. But but, what about the income? Right, we need a job. We need for you to get a job. <laughs> and he had mapped it out. He's a grapher and a charter. So yeah. he had charted out on paper when I needed to get a job by. And he kept, that date was looming, and he would bring up, like, okay, this is wonderful about AA, but what about. You know, this date is a month away, and I had talked to my sponsor about it, Joanne, and she had just said, God's going to take care of that. God's got it. You focus on staying sober one day at a time and doing the right things in sobriety, and I'm confident that that will work out by that date. Mm -hmm. And um, she had such a firm belief that it would 
that I just did exactly what she said. I wrote it on a piece of paper and put it in a God box and let it go and didn't think another thought about it. Oh, so, okay, God boxes. Okay, so there's going to be people listening to this who okay. possibly don't know what a God box is. Right. So talk about a God box, how okay. that came out and what you put in there. And sure. And you ever put anything else in there. So a God box, she explained to me, was simply a box that you obtained. Um, you know, I used a stationary box. And... Her instructions to me were to, when there was something on my mind, because my mind raced before I got sober and my mind raced after I got sober. And um, I didn't realize it then, but that's a common thread that alcoholics generally say is that their brain goes faster than the average person's does. And I believe that to be true. So um, the God box is just a way for you to physically do something with whatever it is you're obsessing about. So she would have me write down every single thing that I was worried about, write down potential outcomes, what I was worried about, what my feelings were about it. And I was to be very descriptive. So I made sure God, because I was the end result was that I was putting this in the God box and then I couldn't think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. I had to leave it to God. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like God needed a lot of help in that capacity. And so I wrote a lot of details <laughs> down, wanting to make sure God was absolutely clear on what my circumstance was. So, um, and then I would put it in the God box and it was a good reminder every time I would start to obsess about that. Oh, I put it in the God box. So I'll roll on with my day. So the, um, date came and I was employed one day after the drop dead date. Really? Yeah. According to the graph. By yeah, according the to the graph. Yeah. Yes. And, he, and I later found out he padded the graph a little bit. So we actually had a few more. <laughs> Uh, a little bit longer to not be concerned, but he was um, playing nervous. Playing it safe, right? Yeah, he was playing it safe, and I think he was a little nervous that I was not nervous. <laughs> so I was just busy focusing on Did sobriety. you let him know that everything was in the God box and yeah, just to relax? he is not one of us, and so that did not make him comfortable at all. That brought him no sense of peace. He tossed and turned at night, very anxious about this. He is... Um, still not one of us. He has learned to sort of turn things over a little bit yeah, by the example of living with me, I right. think. Right. But he is generally not. He is completely non-alcoholic. <laughs> so he thinks we're all a little nutty. All right. So you got the job. So I got the job. And pretty, I, I poured myself into that job. It was the best job I ever had. Tons of fun. Um, was successful there. And I had been sober about... Um, a year. Did you have any kids? At this no, time? Okay. still okay, no, no children. Okay. No children. No, worked full time for about a year and thought, and I was completely into my home group. I mean, those were the people that I ran with on the weekends. I would go to, I was going to two meetings a day. Um, my husband's traveled a lot. And so that left me with a lot of free time. And so I hung out with people in the fellowship um, because I didn't hang out with anybody really before. Or if I did, there were people who drank like me. So right. I, um, you know, I, I surrounded myself. Uh, somebody told me it's hard to fall off if you're sitting in the middle of the wagon. <laughs> and so I made sure I was sitting in the middle of the wagon um, when it came to sobriety and the fellowship. So um, about a year into sobriety, my husband came home and had a wonderful job opportunity up on the East Coast. Oh, okay. And I wasn't and so, were you, so you weren't going to Frisco at this time? Right? No, I was at the it. Legacy Group. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I was at the Legacy Group, mm -hmm. and he came home, and I didn't think moving to the East Coast sounded like any fun, um, but at that point, I had learned about the God Box and learned that I wasn't in charge of the results and learned that my role in the world is just to do the next right thing and leave the results up to God. And so I took that approach with the move process, and it turned out that that was the right thing for his career. So we moved um, northeast. and um, Had you ever lived in the northeast before? No, I would, I'm a Texas girl. Right. And I, aside from a semester abroad, which I vaguely remember because I was drinking a lot then. <laughs> but aside from that, no, I, I'm firmly planted in Texas. So, so did you, I, that must have been a little bit of a culture shock. It was you? a little bit of a culture shock. We lived up there. People say, how did it go? And I'm usually, my typical response is, well, we lived there for 731 days. <laughs> So 
we lived there for 731 days um, and were lucky enough to be able to, uh, with my husband's company, transition back to Texas. Um, By the way, I would have been, it would, I would guess it was a bit of a culture shock for them as well with you being at the mic with your accent. Yes, and such. yes. Um, people generally out? don't take me as a Yankee. I mean, they're pretty much, you know, ask what part of Texas I'm from. <laughs> right. So, yes, but I will say that um, my sponsor gave me some really good direction. And the first thing she told me was that I had to get a sponsor up there which I didn't want to hear at all because I'd grown so close to her in the year that I'd been sober. Um, But she said, that's what you can do for me is, is get a sponsor up there. She also told me to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. Mm -hmm. And that 90 and 90 is really important. I think when someone relocates, because it's very easy to go into another fellowship Mm -hmm. and figure out that things aren't like they are at your home group and that you don't like it or to jump around between groups and not really establish yourself or be known. Mm -hmm. And if you go to 90 meetings in 90 days, people know you. So 90 meetings in 90 days, generally speaking, as you know, uh, is used for the newcomer coming into the room just to make sure that they're established. But that's a very good application as well. When you're relocating, you're getting out of your routine, so to speak, and you're moving to a part of the country or uh, or possibly even another uh, uh, nation or whatever the case may be, you can use that 90 and 90 to get established where you are because it is real easy sure. just to kind of... fall off the radar. People happens, people all the time. And I didn't want to be that. I um, She agreed to still sponsor me while I was looking for a sponsor up there. So I was still talking to her every day and having been so plugged into the fellowship, I was getting phone calls and texts and, you know, all kinds of things the whole time I was up there. Um, So I, I, but I did do the 90 meetings in 90 days and did find a home group that I liked and, and participated in and got to know people and they got to know me. And I've moved two other times in sobriety over my 16 years and I've done the same thing both times. Oh, very nice. So, yeah, when we moved to Austin, I did 90 meetings in 90 days. And then when we moved up to Frisco, I did the same thing. So, it's and a good way to get yourself plugged in. Yeah, yeah. And for, and when did you move to uh, the Frisco group? Like, what year? Probably? Six years ago. Six years yeah. Ago. So, we've been up here six years. Perfect. Time flies by when you have kids. Y- yes, it does. All right. So, we still never did get to the... Oh, okay. So, yeah. And, so, okay. the whole point of that was just to say that I... Um, went from a place of not being able to contribute to society to contributing a little bit in my workspace while I was newly sober and figuring out how to be sober. But what sobriety has done for me over the years, this didn't happen all at once, but it's allowed me to be useful in other arenas of my life too. And once I had children, um, I've got I've got two kids, both in sobriety um, that I that I had in sobriety and. Um, I've discovered a passion for service and that extends beyond the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I, a few, a couple of years ago, I founded an organization, a chapter of an organization that is the largest mother daughter service organization in the United States. It's called National Charity League. Really? Yeah. And the way it works is that moms and daughters participate together when the daughter enters seventh grade and she stays in it all the way through her senior year of high school. Okay. And so the main thing they're committed to, the girls have meetings, the moms have meetings, but the primary thing that they do together is volunteer in the community together. Very nice. Side by side. Wow. So in an organized fashion, you can't just go volunteer anywhere. It's, I mean, we've got a group calendar and you sign up with other pairs and go volunteer What kind of work do you end up doing? I'm curious. So we do a lot with Ronald McDonald House. We we have, there's tons of organizations so you can really pick your passion and find where your passion is. Mary Kate and I did some things with an organization called the Birthday Party Project. What's Um, that? Well, they take, they, uh, it was a Dallas-based philanthropy and it was just a mom who noticed that kids from certain disadvantaged communities Uh, or that were in transient housing or temporary housing, couldn't afford to have birthday parties. And so the Birthday Party Project puts together a party box and sends volunteers and a couple of their staff volunteers and you take into domestic violence shelters or homeless shelters and celebrate all the kids that are having a birthday that month. Yeah, it's a really cool organization. So we've done some of that, Ronald McDonald, um, and that actually is our favorite. Mary Kate's loves ministering to and helping kids in that are sick. Um, and I would have never, you know, again, to go from 
such a self-centered person sitting on my sofa with thinking about Sherman with Sherman thinking about you know that tomorrow is going to be the day that I get it together to actually being president of an organization that has 250 moms and daughters in it is pretty remarkable I mean and it's testimony to that that's a power greater than me I couldn't have done that God bless you that's fantastic. I mean yeah so your daughter though is so what she doing in, right now so she is um, not through National Charity League, but through some friends of hers that she met in National Charity League is at an orphanage in Mexico currently. And she's been down there for a few days and um, they took the orphans to a public swimming pool because they don't get, I mean, they have to have floaties because they don't, they don't know how to swim. And, and so she helped them in the pool. And I guess maybe she swallowed a little water. I don't know. But she's been sick to her stomach for a couple of days. So <sighs> it's a very powerless feeling being 12 hours away right. and having a child that doesn't feel so well. But she's being a good sport. And so she'll just be glad to get home tomorrow. But, I, you know, it's um, what I've found in sobriety is that life gives you opportunities to practice what you preach. Yeah. And so the whole let go and let God and God box thing and yeah. realizing that I just need to do the next right thing and it'll take care of itself has come into play just in the last 24 hours. Especially when it's your kids. Oh, right? yeah. I mean, I'd change places with her in a heartbeat, right. but that's not possible. So right. here we are today. And I told John before we got here that uh, started today that I'm not feeling overly serene or overly profound. So, <laughs> um, but uh, it's a day at a time kind of deal. And that's where I am today. That's right. And we both agree that many times uh, when we go to meetings, uh, we don't feel like going into a meeting because we are uh, profound and or serene. Yes. But once you... Once you leave, you realize that was where your um, serenity was in the first place, right, was to be obtained in the meeting. Right. So the time I heard that early in sobriety, like whenever you don't want to go to a meeting, that's when you really need to go. Right. Because that's your alcoholism telling you, you don't need a solution and you really need a solution. That's and right. so... Um, I've, I do that today still. If I think, oh, I don't know, it's getting close to noon, <laughs> I more often than not make myself get up and go if I'm thinking I don't need to go. All right, let's dig into your story a little bit more. So tell me, you know, obviously you're a Texas girl. You yep. were raised here. Uh, where, where did you, just in brief, you know, where mm -hmm. did you grow up? And So I grew up outside of Fort Worth on Eagle Mountain Lake. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I am an only child uh -huh. and an only grandchild. So didn't have a lot of, yeah, that's unusual. You don't usually what? meet very many people who are only children and only grandchild. And grand an only grandchild. Yeah, too. my dad yeah. is an only child as well. Yeah. So on that I'm, side of the family. I am an only child. Oh, there so you go. Wow. Well, yeah. um, but I'm not an only grandchild. Yeah. That would be kind of almost tough, it would seem like. Well, you know, if you don't know any differently, yeah. then... No, no. What I mean is not not tough to grow up in, but tough to ac accomplish. Like, you know, yes, with, with so many... there's a lot of eyes on you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of eyeballs on you. And I was paranoid to start with. So you put a lot of eyeballs on a paranoid person and, you know, that made me get in my head even more. Um, and, um, actually my parents, I, I don't always interject this, but my, um, grandparents and, and parents too owned liquor stores. That's what we did. That's what my family did. So it's really not overly surprising that, um, I found alcohol at a fairly young age and liked the way that felt. Um, right. and, uh, you didn't have to find it. Really. No, it was no, right it, was, there. it was there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so but I was surrounded, my mother is an alcoholic, but other than that, I was surrounded by loving grandparents and a uh, father. My parents had gotten divorced when I was young, but my grandmother was the person that I was really the closest to. Uh, she was very stable, had a great sense of humor, great sense of style, full of wisdom, common sense, um, wit, was just uh, everything I wanted to be. And that's... Um, who my daughter's named after. Oh. Um, so, yeah, so Mary Kate is uh, is named after Gran. But um, I didn't really, while I knew alcohol, I, I didn't understand what the big deal was because I grew up seeing everybody drink. So I, alcohol was, you know, you know, when I was in high school, kids would act like it was a huge deal that I had access to alcohol, and I didn't really <laughs> put two and two together like that. You know, that like I was the <laughs> You're the popular yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get it that that maybe it was because they wanted a six pack or a four pack of wine coolers, you know, right. or a six pack of beer. Um so I went off to college and I was a pretty 
normal drinker in college like everybody else, but I do reflect now and look back and see that my drinking, I, I think I liked it more than other people liked it. So I, we all partied the same. It looked the same from the outside, mm-hmm. but I needed it and I looked for opportunities to drink that other people maybe didn't. Right. Um, and so, like our book tells us, it's a progressive disease. It did with me. Um, I became somewhat of a wine aficionado and learned about wine. And for and those listening who may not understand what you mean by the term progressive, why don't yeah. you just dive into that a little bit? So, progressive means that it doesn't stop and it gets worse over time, never better. So, you know, for me, progressive alcoholism looked like drinking some on the weekends, then drinking some during the week, then drinking virtually every day, then drinking every day. And the isms that go along with that are progressive too. So for me, when I joked a minute ago saying I was paranoid to start with because I had all those eyeballs on me, but that's really true. I was in my head a lot and worried frequently about what other people thought. I was, I, I was extremely self-centered, and I wouldn't have thought myself, because I, when I think of someone self-centered, I think of someone who's somewhat grandiose, and they like the fact that they're self-centered. Yeah. I wanted to be invisible. I did not want to be, I mean, I, I didn't want to be the center of attention, and somehow I found myself to be that more than I wanted to be. Right. Okay, so go back to, uh, you were talking about the liquor store and sure. what you had. Uh... So, yeah, I mean, I think I was a pretty normal drinker in college. It wasn't until um, I was out of college and had met my husband. He was then my fiance. Um, I worked for an airline in leadership development and traveled around the country speaking for um, Southwest Airlines. And that is a fun place to work if you like to drink. Yeah. <laughs> um, that it was part of the culture. I don't know that it is as much anymore, but this was 20 some odd years ago. Yeah, and even the uh, CEO. Herb the, Kelleher. Yeah. Huge drinker. Huge drinker. And I mean, a smoker. smoker too, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. He used to be, I mean, I, it was, I, I think back, and for a work environment to think he would have four or five cigarettes going in a meeting. <laughs> And sit them on the table, and like the, you'd, you'd stare, thinking we're about to catch on fire. One of those is going to catch the table on fire, and invariably, when the ashes would get close to the table, he would pick one up. But that sounds insane now to say that somebody smoked five cigarettes at the same time and had wild turkey a lot. So and this was in corporate meetings. This wasn't like after hours at happy hour. I mean, this is in the middle of the day. So I ran into, it's interesting because I ran into somebody that I used to work with at Southwest just a few months ago. Um, I was at a convention for National Charity League Mm -hmm. and I ran into somebody that I used to work with in that same department at Southwest Airlines, completely just random. I'm in Long Beach, California, and she comes up and says, Christina. (laughs) And so we had an opportunity to catch up for a minute. And I said, was that as crazy as I remember that being? And she said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I said, because sometimes I think maybe I'm exaggerating. She goes, you're not. It was absolutely wild. And it, it I mean, it was unbelievable that, that we got away with all we got away with and still managed to have careers that, that were on track. But uh, so anyway, I when I started hiding my drinking, I think was when I became aware that it was becoming a problem. And what I would do my husband would, would travel, and when he was home, I took great pride in cooking a big elaborate meal and getting a bottle of wine that would go with the dinner. Um, and what he didn't know was that I had probably almost, if not a full bottle of wine before he got home. Yeah. So I'd have a bottle of wine on the table. He'd come in and go, oh, we, we're having wine. I'm like, yeah, I got this. I thought it'd go really nice with whatever it was I was cooking. And he would um, open the bottle and pour some for him and some for me. And I remember I would say, well, how was your trip? Or tell me about this meeting. And he would start talking. And all I could focus on, I I wasn't listening to what he said. I was staring at his wine glass (laughs) because I wanted him to drink enough before I picked the bottle up and poured some more in my glass. So it didn't look like I was drinking very fast or very much. But I mean, God only knows what I missed in the way of conversation (laughs) because I was busy staring at his glass. Um, waiting for him to have had enough so that I could have some, some more. And then he would go to bed and I would stay up and drink and, um, work. I was still working at that time before I'd gotten laid off. And it really wasn't until I got laid off that, um, I 
started drinking around the clock. It had, it had progressed. Um, again, we talked about that progressive thing. It had progressed um, to where I didn't just want to drink. I didn't just need to drink every now and then. I had to drink. Right. And so it got to the point where I had to drink. I couldn't think. I couldn't function. I couldn't do anything without um, having a glass of wine. And I, I say a glass of wine, and I'm holding a large tumbler right now of Coke Zero from Sonic, and that might be my glass of wine right there. That That's about what I would call a glass of wine 16 right. years ago was a huge tumbler. Right. So don't think crystal, crystal champagne glasses because that wasn't <laughs> what I was drinking out of. Um, but, uh, anyway, so I, yeah, I was drinking way too much and I knew it and he was on a business trip and I had one of those moments that I think every alcoholic has where there's just a little window sliver of opportunity, um, where God opens a door just a little bit. And it occurred to me that I couldn't stop drinking. Um, I had, uh, we'd had a big party the night before and I had, it was in February of 2002, and we had a hot tub and a swimming pool, and I had, we'd been in the hot tub, and I remember vividly being in the hot tub, thinking everybody else was really, really wasted, and thinking I was okay. I thought, these people can't handle their alcohol. I mean, I'm the only one that's even remotely sober. They had long since quit drinking, and I'm drinking straight vodka at yeah. this point. Yeah. Um, and I woke up the next morning, and I had a jammed thumb, jammed finger. uh uh-huh. No idea how I'd gotten it. I used to say I wasn't a blackout drinker. And I still say that's true. I'm not a complete blackout drinker, but there were times where I'd have to have some facts about what had gone on the night before. <laughs> and then I could kind of piece it together in my head. But um, not, I, I, you know, I didn't lose days or, or periods, huge spots of time. But, I mean, they're, they're, things were fuzzy <laughs> a lot of the time. So anyway, I woke up with this jammed finger, and my husband had to leave on business. And I, um, every time, you know how jammed finger is, every time you move it, you think you're fine, and then you start to move your jammed finger, and it's like it hurts really badly. And so um, I think that jammed finger is what helped me get sober, now looking back, because it, it was so painful, and I would forget about it, and then I'd start to move my hand, and it would hurt again, and it reinforced in my mind that this is not normal. Right to drink this way like this and to not remember how I got a jammed finger is not normal. Right. And so I called Alcoholics Anonymous. So um, how did you find them just out of curiosity? I don't know. I just knew if you wanted to quit drinking, you went to AA. Like, and, like did you find them on the internet? Oh, um, yeah. Phone I book? Yeah, phone book. Um, and it was the Legacy Group. And I called uh, and a guy answered the phone and I had practiced what I was going to say. So, cause I didn't want him to think that I drank too much. Like, I mean, I wanted him to think I drank a little too much, but I wasn't about to tell anybody I was drinking vodka in the mornings. Right. <laughs> right. So I called and I said, so yeah. you had a script laid out. Right. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it was in my head, but yeah, I said, you know, I just was calling to get some information about your program and, um, trying to be proactive here and get a little bit of information. And he said, um, what do you do? Sit around drinking wine all day. <laughs> And I thought, my God, somebody's been looking in my windows. Um, and I said, no, I don't. I, well, okay, maybe, uh, okay, yeah, I sort of do. Yeah. And he said, well, why don't you do this? He goes, a lot of people have been in your situation before. And what they do is um, they come to a meeting or two. And it'll become pretty apparent once you get here whether or not this is your problem. Maybe this isn't your problem. And... I said, okay. And he said, I said, are you going to be there? Because I wanted a name. I mean, I, I was looking at this like it was an appointment. <laughs> so he said, I'm not going to be, but hold on a second. And he hollered at some guy. And the guy said, if she's coming at 730, tell her I'll meet her here. So I didn't know who this person was from Adam, right? But I knew I had a name and that he was expecting me to be there at 730. So the clocks, yes, this is like 3, 4 o'clock. I'm thinking, man, I should call and cancel. Five o'clock, I'm getting jittery. I I, yeah, I need to, I mean, I, I maybe I need to have a little glass of wine here just to get me through until 7.30. Like, I don't know about this and trying to not drink. And six o'clock, I'm just an absolute wreck. But I got ready and got dressed um, in something that looked like, you know, I'd, I'd been dressed all day. Not like I'd been sitting in sweats on the sofa. <laughs> Um, and I showed up at 7.30, and I had my script of what I was going to tell him so that he would think I drank a little bit too much, but not a lot bit too Over much. The top. Right. right. 
So I hit the door and he said, you must be Christina. And I just lost it. I started crying. I'm not a crier. And I was crying and I went into the bathroom and I kept apologizing when I'd come out. And I think looking back, he, I just remember him. He was a big guy and he just hugged me. And he said, it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. And the first woman that came through the door was Joanne. And frankly, I think he was glad to hand me off. <laughs> I was a little bit of a hot mess. And she sat down with me and, and, and sat by me during the meeting and later became my sponsor. Um, I noticed at the end, frequently in meetings, they'll say, um, if there's anybody here who needs a sponsor and you're willing to be a sponsor, raise your hand. Well, I noticed she didn't raise her hand, but people kept talking about getting a sponsor. And I'm waiting for her to raise her hand, and she wasn't raising her hand. So every day I um, would, the guy that, the, the first guy I met in the program bought me my big book. Um, and um, so I would ask her, what do I need to do out of this book? Like, what, do I, what should I be doing? So she would give me assignments every day. And then she'd say, what are you doing tomorrow? Well, I was unemployed. My husband's traveling. What am I doing? Nothing. <laughs> Is what I'm doing. Me and Sherman are going to be on the couch. So she said, well, why don't you come to a noon meeting? And, and, see, and see, noon meetings have always been key to my sobriety because I drank in the mornings and at noon. So, you know, if I didn't have a noon meeting to go to early in sobriety, I think there's a great, greater likelihood I would have not stayed sober. But knowing that I was going at noon, I could make it till noon. Mm -hmm. And then I'd get enough at noon of sobriety and serenity and the program. And sometimes we'd go to lunch afterwards, and then I'd be able to hold on until that night. Yeah. But I'm a firm believer, believer that, that meetings are very critical and that you can't do this program in your head by yourself. That's right. I mean, I, I, I meet so many people who... Um, think that they can do recovery, they can read the book and do the steps by themselves. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't work that way. It's been my experience that yeah, it doesn't, that those people are the ones that just go away and maybe they come back and maybe we never see them again. Right. So when did kids come into the picture? Here? I, you, uh, Seven years after um, I got sober, uh, when we moved to Pennsylvania and I was, I, I had to stop my job because it was, my job was in Dallas and we were moving to the East Coast. And so um, I stayed up there and we bought a house that was built in 1920 and it needed a lot of things redone on the inside. It was, it was kind of a mess and I was going to restore it. And it was during that process. Is that, that something you enjoy doing? Yeah. Too? And it's funny because when I'm not doing nonprofit work now, yeah. I, I'm a designer. Oh, I went back okay. and got certified and do that. Wow. But I, I learned how to do that in sobriety. I mean, I'd always kind of liked doing it, but I learned how to do that. It's amazing what sobriety, the doors that sobriety opens up for you. Right. Um, and I don't market, I don't advertise, it just, I, 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 it's word of mouth. And a lot of it comes through the service work that I do where somebody will be in my home or I'll be in their home and they'll say, what do you think? You, you decorate some, what do you think I should do here? And so I wind up getting customers that I way. That. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and I don't have to try. Like right. I used to think life was about trying really hard. Right. And that whoever tried the hardest won. <laughs> right. And I, I, I'm more inclined to take it easy these days. Although I do uh, overcommit in service work, but that's a good problem to have. So you moved up to Pennsylvania. You're redesigning that place. Yep. And, and I find out I'm pregnant. And I um, was scared to death. Child number one, right? Child number one. Yeah. Scared to death to be a mom. Scared to death. I um, remember when they were discharging me from the hospital, I thought... They're insane. I have no, I mean, I'm not qualified for this. Like, that, I need to stay here a few more days. Like, <laughs> to take the course. Yeah, just to, I, like, I did not get the manual. Um, and as luck would have it, she was a, an extremely easy baby. She slept through the night from six weeks on, and she's just a, been a blessing to, to have and raise. Yeah. I mean, she's just a, an easy, breezy, good girl. Yeah. Um, and then two years and nine months later, Andy came along. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andy probably, I think my husband is extremely laid back and my daughter's extremely laid back. And Andy is a whole lot of me. <laughs> so he can be a lot to handle. So I say all the time that if I'd had him first, he would have been an only child. Because <laughs> he's a lot of work, that one. <laughs> yeah, he, um, his, and, and I understand the way his brain works because it works a lot like mine. And in some ways that's kind of a scary thing because I think... You know, I, I, he has a lot of the isms that uh, that I associate with alcoholism. He's 10 years old, but he has a lot of the isms. Yeah. But I'm hopeful that he sees me practicing the tools of the program yeah. 
and that maybe that won't be his path. Or that if it is, you know, he'll know where to go for help someday. He, um, classic line, not too long ago, I, he was, I, we were talking about something, and my perception was that he was arguing with me. And so he's explaining to me, you know, he's, he's arguing with me is what he was doing. <laughs> and I said, will you stop arguing with me? And he said, I'm not arguing. I'm just explaining why I'm right. <laughs> My son has that particular shirt. I get it. I completely get it. Golly. I mean, wow. Um, Talk about, so you mentioned there that hopefully they'll be able to see you, Andy in particular, will be able to see you using the, quote, tools of the program. And we talk about that, right? A simple kit of spiritual tools. Where does your mind go when you think of those tools? Well, I think one thing that I've shared, um, you know, I've talked about before is the ability to pause when I'm irritated, doubtful, unsure of what to do. I, life was about reacting to me. Um, and I was always wanting to have an appropriate response, whatever that would be. But I, I didn't allow myself a window. I mean, I was so convinced I was right that I would react and respond and not pause. Um, And when you pause, when you're in a situation where you're uncomfortable or you're not feeling, feeling spiritual or serene, what I've learned is that when I pause, I'm able to think through what's the next right thing to do. Um, I'm able to, to sort of get in touch with my higher power in that moment and think about the appropriate way to respond. And there are times um, I shared in a meeting just a couple of weeks ago that like you, you have to be careful when you pause because when you pause, it tells you in the book, you don't just pause, you ask for directions. So you ask for directions on where, you know, you ask God to remove the fear, ask for directions on what you need to do next. And there's a difference between that and pausing just to wait until you can prove your point to make sure you were right. <laughs> So, um, I've, I've, there is a difference. There's a difference between the two. So today, I try to pause and really think cognitively. You know, like, all right, what, what situation am I in, and what, what are the right things to do in in this situation? And um, more often than not, it's not an elaborate scheme that I would have come up with before, but it's something very simple. Right. I noticed you saying something earlier about uh, this is the story I was locking in on. And that made me also thinking about your, you know, the idea of pausing in that um, when I'm in a conversation with people Mm -hmm. or even when I'm not in a conversation Mm -hmm. with them and they're off in the distance and there's a story that I can lock in on to protect myself, generally Mm -hmm. speaking, about what is going on with that person and what they're thinking. Right. And so sometimes we have to back off and just say, maybe this is not actually what they're thinking. Right. And let's pause. Yes. And get into a new reality. Right. And and I don't know if you call it react or you know, just react in a different way than I normally would. Right. Because I didn't know how to respond. When I first got sober, I mean, alcohol gave me all my answers. So when I first got sober, I didn't know how to respond to life. I remember being in the grocery store. I heard something early on where they said, you need to change everything. Change everything. Whatever you did before, change everything. So I took that literally and I changed grocery stores. And I was in the grocery store. Well, because, I mean, they told me to change everything. I was trying to follow instructions. So um, I'm in a different grocery store. And every end cap or everywhere I looked, there was wine. And I started getting nervous and panicked. And I couldn't find what I was looking for because I don't know this grocery store. And all I could see was wine. And I called my sponsor, freaked out. Um, that I, all I could find was wine. I was looking for beans. I couldn't find beans. All I could find was wine. There was wine everywhere. And she gave me some wonderful counsel in that moment that I've, I still use today and use it with people I work with. She said, Christina, stop for just a minute. What would a sober, responsible, graceful, mature, respectful, logical woman do in this situation? And I said, well, I guess she would calmly walk up and down the aisles until she found the beans. And she said, okay, so do that right now. And so I've used that a lot when I get in a situation where I don't know how to act. It's easier for me, instead of figuring out what I'm going to do, if I think, what would a normal, sober, gracious, professional, articulate, what would, what would that woman do in this situation? 
and then I'm able to take that and whatever advice that is, transfer it over to me. It's easier for me to do that and think what somebody, what, what someone else should do that has those qualities than to recognize that I've got some of them myself. Very nice, yeah. Kind of, you take yourself out of it, out of your body, so yes. to speak. Yeah. Kind of look in on mm-hmm. yourself and think about, okay, this is me reacting, but what would a graceful, right. healthy individual do in this particular situation? Right, because we still get in our minds where we are not graceful, healthy, and mature and professional. Right. You know, I mean, our, that's that's alcoholism. Right. So. Um, I remember I was six years sober getting my six year chip in Austin and I stood up and I said, I really can't believe I'm getting this chip because I do so much wrong. I mean, there's, there's, I could tell you what all I do wrong in my program. I could stand up here for, you know, 20 minutes telling you what all I do wrong. (laughs) And, um, I don't really do very much right. I mean, I don't think I do very much right in this program. And somebody came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, did it ever occur to you that you are just six years sober? You're not 16 years. You're not 26 or 36 years. You've just been sober six years. I mean, you're like a kid um, just starting to sober up and and realize like a six-year-old the way the world works. And I found that to be really true as I've progressed in sobriety, that like the older I get and the, the longer I'm sober, the more I'm able to think, okay, I can see where I was then, I can see what some of my weaknesses were at that time and see the growth. Right. And that's what keeps me coming back and, and looking up to people that have more time than me. Right. I, I have the same sponsor, Joanne, that I started with. Um, and she's, she finally agreed after I begged enough for her to continue sponsoring me when I was in Pennsylvania and then in Austin. And she's still my <laughs> sponsor today. That's great. So, yeah. So I've been with her for all 16 years. I have my original sponsor as well. That's really cool. I, I, tell, I still tell them I'm uh, test driving them. Uh, yeah, I know. You know, like a temporary Right, sponsor, sure. You Just know. to see we'll, how it works out. We'll see how this works out. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. That's been, yeah, and, you know, I, I tell people all the time, though, um, and I have gotten better over the years, but I still many times will say, I've been sober way too long to be this immature. Right. (laughs) It is. It's miraculous that I'm still sober with some of the shenanigans (laughs) I've pulled. But it just goes to show you that if you, you know, if you, and it says in the book that if we try half as hard as we did to obtain and conceal our alcohol drinking, you know, the the consumption of liquor, if we go about sobriety with even half the energy that we did in our active disease, that we cannot fail. I mean, it says that, that we cannot fail. And I liked the, that promise. I, I like how many times it says in the big book that, you know, with these tools or with this attitude, you can't fail. Because I needed a fail-proof system. Right. I needed to know that failure, because in my mind, failure wasn't an option. Right. I mean, AA was the last house on the block. I had tried every possible way of getting sober. And, um, you know, I, I desperately wanted to not drink. Right. Um, and I wanted to not feel the way I felt too. I didn't understand that the two were tied together. Right. And in how it works, it says, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly thoroughly followed our path. path. Yeah. I, I followed it. I mean, I was a little crazy when I first started. She, my sponsor would give me an assignment and I got a binder and would type out responses and make a copy for her and a copy for me because I wanted to make sure that I was doing things thoroughly. And at some point she said, you know, you really don't have to do this. And we get just together and talk, get together and talk. You don't have to provide a thesis for every step. Um, but you know, that was a way for me to feel like at that time that I was doing it, um, as, as good as I could. Good. Yeah. Well, very nice. Well, I know you came in here saying you don't feel, uh, profound or, uh, right. but how was, how was the experience for you? I was, I mean, it's good. I like, um, you know, I, I do like recovery and I like being around other alcoholics. Good. And so it's. It's, I feel better when I'm able to talk through what's in my head. And that's something I've learned, too, in the program that, you know, if we share the, the joy with other people, it multiplies. And if we share the pain or the worry or the angst, it about divides it in half. Yeah. So that's been true in my program for sure. Very good way to put it. This has been great, Christina. Thank, Thank you, you for coming Thanks in. For having I appreciate me. it. All right, so uh, we welcome your thoughts and feedback. Once again, you can contact us at feedback at soberspeak.com.
dot com. We want to make this a dialogue. Uh, we want to we um, try to share our experience, strength, and hope. And uh, we want you to provide your comments and or suggestions. Uh, thank you in whatever form you support the program, whether it's sharing with somebody else or just listening in as you are able. So I'm going to read a little bit of uh, page 164 of our book here to close it out. On page 164, the very uh, last paragraph, it says, Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to Him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. Thanks for listening, everybody.